Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. However, the Russia-Ukraine crisis unfolds with its political and military dimensions. The Middle East is more than a curious bystander watching a tense face-off in the neighborhood. It will have significant implications for the relative power and influence of Russia and the United States. The value of alliances, formal ones such as NATO and less formal ad hoc coalitions in Syria and elsewhere, will be tested. Governments from Beirut to Baghdad and Ankara to Amman will reassess their policies. So while the immediate turn of events is too risky to forecast in this form, we will try to analyze implications from the Russia-Ukraine crisis on the Middle East in general and Israel in particular. Joining us from Berlin, Germany to do so, Professor Zev Khanin, who is a expert on Russian and Middle Eastern studies at bar Ilan and Ariel Universities, as well as a visiting professor at Postdom University in Germany. Thank you for joining us. A pleasure to be with you. Indeed, as well as with us here in the studio, our retired Colonel Dr. Iran Lerman, who is the co-host of TV7 Middle East Review, Powers and Play panelist, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and Editor-in-Chief of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune, mm -hmm. as well as Mr. Amir Oren, who is TV7 Editor-at-Large and host of TV7 Watchmen Talk, Powers in Play, and so much more. Mr. Oren, I'd like to start with uh, asking you for somewhat of an overview of the current perspective of what we may now see in the Middle East with the things unfolding, the various events unfolding in uh, the northern arena of Ukraine and Russia. So if you go back um, a week ago or so uh, to Jerusalem, um, there was uh, a certain sense of luxury because this is not a crisis Israel is uh, involved in uh, intimately. However, there was a problem with the Israelis and Jews residing in the Ukraine. And uh, for the first time in 30 years or so, um, Israel had to prepare for an airlift of those who would like to get uh, out of uh, Kiev and other places uh, in the Ukraine, should they uh, feel the need. Now, obviously, this is uh, what Israel uh, has already done in Ethiopia. Uh, but uh, in Europe, there were preparations uh, for such uh, an operation mm. in uh, 1991, uh, 92, when there was fear that um, uh, Jews in the uh, deteriorating uh, situation uh, in the Soviet Union, in, in the then Soviet Union, uh, will be uh, under danger. And there were plans to tell them to go to certain airfields in order to be taken out of the country. So um, in that sense, um, Israel, more than other yeah. Middle Eastern countries, has been watching uh, the crisis. But on another level, as you said in your introduction, the question here is, uh, can the United States be relied on as a patron and partner? Is um, Joe Biden um, built of uh, presidential timber? Can he really uh, take on, in this case, Vladimir Putin, perhaps in other cases, the uh, Chinese the, or the North Koreans? And um, of course, uh, if there are military lessons to be learned, either by deterrence exercises or actual combat, <clears throat> the Israel Defense Forces uh, will, of course, be ready to absorb and analyze those. Indeed. I'd like to uh, uh, turn to you, Professor Hanin. Uh, since uh, the situation on the Ukraine-Russia uh, front is an evolving one and uh, multiple elements may uh, uh, evolve or change down the minute, I'd like to actually take this uh, one step backwards and, and focus more on the strategic power composition from within this uh, uh, situation, uh, specifically on the implications to the Middle East. How do you see currently Moscow communicating about 
the situation in Syria, for instance, the situation in Iran, both countries uh, where Moscow does have a fair amount of influence. Are we going to see a certain uh, turn of events with regard to the way it uh, conducts its day-to-day -day business in order to somewhat, uh, if I may uh, quote uh, General Kurila, who is expected to be the, the new CENTCOM commander, uh, he defined it as potentially becoming a spoiler for the region. Do you see this uh, emerge in the near future? Uh, indeed. Uh, all this situation has uh, at least five perspectives. Russian perspective, Ukrainian perspective, uh, European perspective, American perspective, and Israeli-Jewish perspective. Uh, in the context, uh, including the context of the Middle East. Uh, I hope you will permit me to address to each of them a little bit later, but coming back to your uh, major question of the moment, I would say that, uh, continuing to what Amir said, uh, that Israel, of course, is caring about what is going on in Ukraine with the Jewish community, the second largest in the former Soviet Union, and uh, including between 15,000 to 20,000 Israelis, uh, at, at the moment, we can see that uh, this community is not very much anxious about what is going on, uh, and uh, as well as the general uh, Ukrainian society. Uh, not everybody happy about what is going on, but there is no panic. No much migration, emigration among the 15,000 Israelis, less than one third registered in the uh, Israeli embassy for evacuation and so on and so forth. So uh, the situation, uh, I would say that some observers believe uh, that uh, their escalation is much on much more in the diplomatic and information field rather than with the, exactly the military field and the public field. So uh, in this case, uh, some of the local observers, I would say, um, um, they believe or at least they think uh, that uh, the Americans uh, and Europeans and uh, Israelis are, um, in the recent days they escalated, uh, escalate their rhetorics and are talking about uh, um, um, a forthcoming uh, entrance of, of the Russian troops uh, in, the Israel, in the Ukrainian land, I'm sorry, uh, meaning that it what might happen the 11th of February, which never happened, you know. Uh, another day, it's our 14th or 15th, that means today or tomorrow and so on and so forth, that just because uh, uh, to show to the Kremlin uh, that everybody uh, is uh, standby and uh, uh, the Russian um, invasion uh, will not be taken as, uh, as a surprise, at least. A date might, li might limit uh, Mr. Putin and all his team uh, to be, uh, or may maybe to take in consideration the fact that it would be better uh, to, to be more careful in their steps, including his steps in the Middle East, uh, because uh, another theory shows that uh, in, the, uh, in return, for um, uh, giving up or for uh, entering Ukraine, uh, Russia will demand from the West, uh, from the West uh, other concessions, uh, including the concessions in Syria, meaning uh, to increase uh, the Russian role uh, here in the Syria and also to press on Israel in order to stop Israeli activities um, uh, in Syria in order to defend uh, our national interests uh, and as well as uh, to refocus. Uh, the interest of the of the world uh, from Iranian issue uh, to Ukrainian issue, and there will then uh, at least Ukrainian observers uh, are talking about that quite a lot, uh, as well as uh, some Israelis, uh, and that will permit uh, the United States to uh, relax, uh, to decrease, or maybe even abolish taxes. Uh, excuse me, uh, abolish uh, um, uh, sanctions against Iran because uh, everybody, the whole world. Uh, will be interested more in what is going on around Ukraine rather than the other aspects uh, uh, of this problem. Uh, so from this uh, from the geostrategic point of view, uh, Mr. Putin uh, is also interested from on, the, on his side uh, to get as much as possible from this situation, uh, to continue uh, the list of successes uh, he gained uh, in 2021, meaning the Anschluss of Belarus. In fact, uh, um, the, um, I would say, um, the hesitation or the balancing, attempts to balance uh, for regime in contemporary Belarus uh, between the West and Russia is stopped at the moment, it's finished, uh, in fact, at the satellite of Russia, and this is the big success of the Kremlin. Second, uh, they succeeded uh, to preserve uh, the pro-Russian um, regime 
uh, in Kazakhstan. And finally, they want in the gas war, you know, this, the Northern Streams. The second uh, is actually, everybody, it is clear to everybody that whatever happens in Ukraine or around it, uh, Europeans are not interested to stop this project and, uh, um, uh, and the United States are ready to support it. So, of course, uh, uh, Russia has uh, in this situation uh, uh, a long list of other interests, but uh, we can address for that uh, later on, if you please. Indeed. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Lillman, when we're really looking at the situation, both Professor Khanin and Mr. Owen spoke about uh, the quite sizable amount of Israelis residing in uh, Ukraine, also the Jewish community there, uh, the prime minister's office, as well as the foreign ministry uh, here in Jerusalem, communicated about the fact that there are Jews living in both Russia and Ukraine, and that Israel is not a party to this conflict. Nevertheless, when we really are looking at the situation, we do see a uh, air travel of, of multiple aircraft trying to bring back the Israelis uh, currently in, in Ukraine. Not all of them have returned. Nonetheless, uh, the majority did. Uh, and uh, we heard, of course, also uh, minister of, of the diaspora and uh, uh, absorption uh, affairs, uh, Mr. Yeah, Nachman sure. Shai, uh, communicate about the necessity to prepare for mass aliyah, mass migration potentially of, of uh, uh, Jews residing in Ukraine and, and in that uh, region, something that subsubsequently also triggered an, uh, a interministerial of the prime minister's office that uh, sought to head such a discussion of uh, uh, potential implications for such a, a scenario. Do you see this as a viable reality? Well, I, I would say that we, uh, uh, of course, as, as usual, focus on the immediate Jewish and Israeli angle, but the implications of this crisis are much wider. And uh, the challenge to us in Israel is, of course, that we need to retain a working relationship with Putin's uh, government in, in Russia, whatever happens, because uh, our operations in Syria are vital to our national interests, and so is the deconfliction mechanism with Russia. And we have angered our friends in the West before when we tried to avoid taking a position on the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, when there was a vote at the UN, luckily there was a strike at the foreign ministry, so uh, uh, our ambassador was absent. But uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, clearly our sentiments uh, are against aggression, are against, and in support of... Uh, of uh, sovereignty, but uh, of the nations, but uh, the Russian question for us is a delicate and vital one. However, I would say also that while the Americans may come out looking, uh, uh, um, let's say, hesitant as a result of this crisis, this doesn't necessarily mean that the imprint and impact of Russia in the region would grow. Uh, the, the complications of conflict in Russia's immediate environment actually limit the resources available to Russia for actions beyond its borders or, in, or uh, beyond the near abroad, as it's referred to. And this is a country we need to keep reminding ourselves of very limited economic resources. With that being said, of course, uh, there was the meeting between Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin with regard to specifically ensuring uh, the, from Beijing's perspective at least, uh, the Belt and Road success or the, this initiative's success with potentially Russian guarantees of being able to mobilize then and, and provide the security necessary to make this a reality. So do we see here now suddenly a uh, coupling of two interests being brought together and then uh, having the the Chinese bankroll uh, potentially such an endeavor that would then increase Russian influence for the success of this uh, vision that is not just for the next couple of years, but for many years ahead? Well, I would, I would, if I was in a position to give advice to uh, Vladimir Putin, not that he would listen to me, I would say be very careful. 
um, people nowadays tend to talk about this period uh, we are going, we are living through, is in some ways parallel to the first decade of the 20th century, with Russia, with uh, sorry, with China in the role of Germany, the rising challenger to what was then British uh, global dominance. And Russia does not really want to end up the way the Austrian-Hungarian Empire did, as an adjunct of the rising challenger, because that doesn't bode very well for its future. And in terms of the power relationship and the economic the, uh, imbalance of power between China and today's Russia, it would be a very dangerous thing for Russia to make itself in the long run, let's say, a client of Chinese power. Indeed. When people uh, uh, speak about uh, the Middle East, uh, usually they think in uh, the, uh, inter, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict or inter-Arab uh, relations, even though, of course, there are Muslim non-Arab countries such as Turkey and Iran. But when one goes back to uh, the post-World War II period and 1948, the creation of Israel, the great powers had a lot to do with it. At that time, Great Britain and the Soviet Union with the United States as the rising power. Now, if you look back, uh, Israel, even though uh, it has chosen to orient itself uh, on the United States rather than being neutral or on the Soviet Union, had it easy um, compared to what is happening now with the United States on its way out of the area, at least um, if you look at it uh, through military presence on the ground, and Russia as the rising power with China, as you all mentioned, creeping in steadily. It has its um, timetable. Well, it increased 360 percent of investments just in, in the Middle East. Indeed. But um, even though Israelis uh, instinctively tend to side with the Americans in whatever conflict, it does seem that in this particular case, Russia has a case. Because during the Cold War, the watchword was containment on the American, on the Western part. But here it is Russia which wants to contain the expansion of NATO to its borders. Now, Israel must understand the concept of a buffer state. It wants Jordan to keep being a buffer state on its eastern border, whether it's from Iran or Iraq. And uh, for Russia, it uh, is uh, reasonable to uh, ask uh, NATO to stop at the western edge of the Ukraine rather than um, make Ukraine join. And therefore, if there is a conflict between the Ukraine and Russia 20 years from now, and the Ukraine asks for the other members of NATO to come help it, it will uh, be a world war. So uh, for everyone's sake, uh, whether it does involve um, uh, some shooting or only talking, the crisis should be solved uh, not too far from the contour which Putin put forward. Indeed. With that being said, and with all uh, respect due to Ukraine, this situation is not about Ukraine. It's ultimately about the matter of, of narratives, whether the hegemon, the United States, uh, has the legitimate right to dictate the global rules uh, order, if you will. And on the other hand... The road. Excuse me? Rules of the road. The rules of the Obama road, indeed. Expression. Nonetheless, uh, uh, Russia, and, and we heard President Vladimir Putin speak about this quite often, uh, specifically about uh, the necessity to ensure a certain power, power balance that would then prevent those world wars that you're speaking of. So the question is, Professor Khanin, when we're speaking now, and if you may zoom out and, and uh, we'll put the specifics aside from, from the micro, but look at the macro, to what degree is this current crisis going to impede on uh, the capacity of the United States to, to uh, truly project power 
at uh, the the uh, variables that are undertaken here in the Middle East with challenges uh, coming from both Moscow and Beijing, but right now because of the crisis amplified from Moscow with regard to the necessity to choose sides. Uh, I, if you're talking about the necessity to take side, or uh, if you're talking about Israel, so Israel uh, has no way but not to take side in this conflict. Uh, at the moment, Israel has, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a reasonable partnership relations with both countries, uh, both with Russia and Ukraine. As, as you said before, uh, with all the respect, uh, the whole story, uh, which Israel, um, the whole democracy story, which Israel is the part of, is not about Ukraine. Uh, Russia actually is interested uh, to persuade Americans that's with all the respect, not about Europe as well. Uh, so Russia is interested to, uh, to, to persuade Americans uh, not to increase their presence in the Black Sea, their Navy presence, uh, to get rid of uh, uh, expectation to see Ukraine as a part of the NATO. And Europeans should forget, as far as Russia is concerned, um, about joining uh, uh, Moldova, Ukraine uh, and uh, Georgia uh, into European Europe, uh, Europe, the Union uh, in the foreseeable future. Future. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, as far as Washington is concerned, as we can see the situation at the moment, they are ready to go along, uh, or at least to agree uh, at this uh, certain point, uh, not to deploy uh, their, their military bases uh, in the Ukrainian territory. Uh, that's more or less uh, is agreed uh, in the conversation, or at least as, we, as it was reported, um, in the conversations between American and Russian presidents. Uh, and uh, uh, at the moment, it is believed that, that the United States is ready to put responsibility more on the side of Ukraine in terms of uh, uh, revival of what is called the Minsk process, that meaning uh, the preliminary agreement that was reached in 2015-2016 uh, 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 in terms of the escalation uh, on the Ukrainian and Russian vector. Uh, at the moment, Ukraine is not ready uh, for this step, uh, which means uh, if they would ready, which mean, that means that they will have to reintegrate Eastern Ukraine, uh, uh, meaning Lugansk and Donetsk areas uh, at the federal territories with a special status inside Ukraine, which means that they will have a veto to any of the foreign policy step uh, of the Ukrainian government, which means that the Ukrainian government will declare we will never be a part of Europe and never be a part of NATO. Uh, the good question is whether Americans would agree on that after uh, they uh, uh, um, took their troops out of Afghanistan, uh, decreased their presence uh, in some other areas of the Middle East. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, most of the commentators there believe uh, that uh, since uh, there is a sort of an understanding uh, between Washington and Moscow in this field, uh, and uh, in order to de-escalate the situation in now Ukraine, the only what is left is just to, you know, to persuade the Kiev uh, the Ukrainian government uh, to accept uh, this Munich agreement. Uh, number two, you know, after many decades after the Munich Agreement, if you understand what I mean. Uh, so, um, uh, Kiev at the moment is not ready for that. Ukrainian society is, uh, is not scared about what is going on, uh, believe it or not. Um, uh, they have some other ideas uh, to put on the table to the greater power, but uh, as you said, uh, the greater powers at the moment are trying to reach a sort of agreement between themselves and uh, then to inform uh, Ukraine, uh, Jerusalem uh, and, um, uh, uh, and other uh, capitals uh, what they decided and then to start the discussion from the very beginning. Dr. Leoman? Well, I, w I would say that uh, in the long run, American actions were uh, geared, first of all, to, to shore up NATO once again. And if there's a lesson from this crisis already, it is that uh, contrary to the fantasies of our good friend, Shimon, the late uh, former president, prime minister of Israel, Shimon Peres, military power still matters. And NATO would have to rebuild its capacities 
And European nations would have to change the level of investment in their military capabilities in the coming years. And by the way, this is a drastic shift from vessels of counterterrorism, specifically to vessels of war. And Israel, by the way, can position itself as a contributor, not as a uh, beggar at the gate, but as a significant co contributor to NATO's empowerment. And that could have a very interesting implication. Of course, if we uh, now go through a reconciliation of sorts with Turkey that keeps the gates of Brussels open to us, uh, I think that is an interesting side effect of the situation. And in regionally, the understanding is that nations, small nations, should band together. And we are seeing it happening together in the eastern Mediterranean and across the region, with, uh, again with Israel as a key player. Who are you calling a small nation? <laughs> Israel? Now, um, let us uh, almost, uh, as, as we approach the end... You have one minute. Go ahead. Let us mention the nuclear dimension. Um, consider what would have happened had it been not the Ukraine, but the new Ukraine. Had the Ukraine kept the nuclear weapons, um, which happened to have been stationed on its uh, soil when the Soviet Union disintegrated. And uh, take it to the Iranian case. Uh, not only Israel, but all of the nations of the region and of the world should aspire to keep nuclear weapons out of Iranian hands. Because if there is a conflict, not between Iran and Israel, but Iran and any other Middle Eastern actor, it will be so much uh, graver if they have nuclear weapons. So you're saying the American, Russian, and European guarantees to uh, Ukraine in 94 just doesn't hold anymore? We'll have to see. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Professor Hanin, Dr. Lerman, and Mr. Oren for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we'll see you next time.